Hey, Carl here to say that Music to Code By is now an app called Music to Flow By. Now you can listen to the tracks on your phone with offline capability. The first three tracks are free, and the entire catalog is available by subscription with a new track arriving every month. Just go to musictoflowby.com for all the links. Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And this is Richard Campbell. Yeah, and uh, we're back in the studio recording just before we ship off to London for another stellar NDC conference. This time, this one is in the middle of town, right? Well, it's Westminster, which is still the east side of town, but at least it's in town. Well, as it's near opposed Parliament. To, yeah, as opposed to Docklands, right? Yeah, which yeah. Is it's near out pubs. Of town. That's the only thing that matters. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> and, you know, in the it's morning true. to repent, you can go to Westminster Abbey and go to a service and everything's cool. So that's the way it goes. It kind of works. It kind of works. By the way, walk, James. Walk on some famous people's graves. Oh, I couldn't believe it. I'm walking and I look down and Isaac Newton. Yep. There he is. You're standing over Isaac Newton. And, you know, you're you're stuck there because of gravity anyway uh james i want to tell you that uh People your skype apples your skype photo is you drinking the biggest beer i think i've ever seen in my life I, actually i think that's a pitcher but let's not let's not uh, split hairs oh that's a big beer <laughs> it reminds me of the time richard was at a where were you at a tech ed or something it was a tech ed in atlanta yep and and he had like a what was it? A it was th a three liters of beer. It was a three liter beer. Three liter beer. You know, you're not sober when you decide it's a good idea to drink that, right? Right. It better be a good beer, though. That's a bit of a commitment, you know. <laughs> I cannot remember. <laughs> <laughs> but the funniest thing was what he said. He says, "I have to speak in the morning, and I can only have one beer." <laughs> <laughs> All right, enough chit chat. Let's roll the crazy music for Better Know Framework. Awesome. <laughs> All right, dude, what do you got? I have a really, really cool website that everybody's going to go out to right now. You're going you're gonna to do it, I know. It's caniuse.com. Hmm, what is it? Caniuse.com is a way that you can check to see what features you can use in what browser. And you can search, and it'll tell you the browser score, you know, for, for Chrome, right. Firefox, Safari, Edge, whatever. So there's no guesswork. It's just like you put in the feature, you put in the, you, you see the browsers that support it, and uh, it's pretty cool. See, I was thinking, hoping it was something like, can I use a flamethrower indoors? But okay, <laughs> you know. You know, nothing's stopping you, Richard, except your <laughs> well, own mind. There's there's a few things yeah i can think of a few reasons why that's just not a good idea but. honey why is the kitchen on fire <laughs> it's not just the kitchen's on fire it's that the whole kitchen's on fire <laughs> why is the neighborhood on fire <laughs> <laughs> i've only blown the breaker for the neighborhood once <laughs> anyway i thought you guys would like can i use and by you guys i mean the broader dot net rocks listener community it's uh, it's pretty cool. I've already used it to check up on a few things that I wasn't sure of, and uh, know it, learn it, love it. Who's talking to us today, Richard? I uh, grabbed a comment off of show fifteen hundred because you know we're talking about storytelling today. Yeah, which of course fifteen hundred episode, good celebration. Uh, talked a lot about the history of .NET because yes. that's the book I'm working on. And this comment comes from Steve L, who says I've been a listener to the show for about seven years now. And I've maybe commented once. This show, however, deserves a special mention. I love the story of .NET and what Microsoft was originally trying to achieve and how it evolved over the years. Understanding the outside influences during development of each technology and in contrast, the changes that were happening internally to Microsoft itself at the time was fascinating. Mm. As a developer working on the Microsoft stack, I've lived through this and it certainly took me down memory lane. I'm going to recommend this episode to all developers, Microsoft or not. And I'm looking forward to the book. Yeah. And yeah. I'll tell you, as as I'm deep in this over the Christmas break, taking writing a lot of notes and putting stuff together, a, a big piece for me is, can is there a story here that's compelling beyond folks who've been .NET developers and just want to know why things were the way they were? 
Oh, yeah. I've been pressing against different theses, and one of them is this steady decision-making that Microsoft's made over the years about pragmatic design versus ideal design. Mm. Pragmatic design means I'm willing to accept a certain amount of ugliness because it's compatible or it's easier to implement. Like one would argue web forms is the ultimate manifestation of pragmatic design. Right, right. Uh, and it has consequences that when you look back in hindsight are not always pleasant. But at the time, you know, we've also seen examples of ideal design. And I would argue that stuff like WPF, especially at the beginning, was a very idealistic design and was very hard to approach. Right. Uh, so it's it's one of the elements that I'm starting to weave into the story. This, this idea that I think has got a broad appeal to anyone building and working on things that are complex. Like, how do you want this? What do you uh, like about it? So. Also, the thing I like about the story, Richard, is that it sort of blows through the simple ideas that people have about .NET that have come to it from outside the community. You know, the the sort of the, uh, whatchamacallit, the lore that's built up around it as a Windows-only technology and all this stuff. It, it just sort of breaks through that and says, no, no, this is how it evolved. And when you see that... Yeah. And you see where we came uh, from, where we came. Uh, it's just mind blowing. It's 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 a lot, and it's it's a real jigsaw puzzle to put all these pieces together and get them all working. So I'm still a ways away. I hope to have it done by the end of 2018. That's so cool. But I'm I'll I'll keep you posted. So Steve, thank you so much for your comment. A .NET Rocks mug is on its way to you, and if you'd like a .NET Rocks mug, write a comment on the website at .NET Rocks.com or via any of our social media, because we publish every show to Facebook and Google+. Plus. And if you comment there and we read it on the show, we'll send you a mug. And definitely follow us on Twitter. He's at Rich Campbell. I'm at Carl Franklin. Send us a tweet. We use them to light our flamethrowers. Nice. <laughs> yeah. And with that, let's formally introduce James. James Whitaker's career spans academia, startups, and top tech companies, and starts in 1986 as the first computer science graduate hired by the FBI. Wow. Hey, forget what I said about Richard drinking that three-liter beer. That never <laughs> happened. Uh, James then worked as a freelance developer, most notably for IBM, Ericsson, SAP, Cisco, and Microsoft, specializing in test automation. He joined the faculty at the Florida Institute of Technology, where he continued his prolific publication record in software testing and security. In 2002, his security work was spun off by the university into a startup, which was later acquired by Raytheon. James' first stint at Microsoft was in trustworthy computing and Visual Studio. He then joined Google as an engineering director and led teams working on Chrome, Maps, and Google+. In 2012, James rejoined Microsoft. He's known for being a creative and passionate leader and sought-after speaker and author. Of his five books, two have been Jolt Award finalists and one a bestseller. Follow him on Twitter at DocJamesW and at his website, DocJamesW.com. Uh, welcome. Jolt Awards. That's something I haven't heard in a long time. Yeah, they're still around, man. It's, uh, it was quite an honor. Jolt Cola, all the sugar and twice the caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> Just like my books. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Well, we had you on the show before, but it was like yep. 2009. Really? Has it ago. been that long? What the hell did we yeah. talked about back then? <laughs> testing. Testing, yeah. Yeah, don't do testing anymore. A lot of testers have never forgiven me for giving it up either. Yeah, well. <laughs> well, nope. these days we test on our users, right? Because we know we can yeah, update via, right. the, via needs, the cloud. Who needs testers? Users <laughs> are good at finding bugs. <laughs> Especially <laughs> if you reward them. <laughs> Where's the Every piece of software gets tested. See, so, oh. so uh, the storytelling theme, how does this story evolve? Storytelling, that's my last book, man. Storytelling yeah. is yeah. Um, uh, something that I have been doing. Uh, pretty much all my career and never really appreciating exactly why I was good at it or, or, or why it helped keep accelerating my career, mm -hmm. always making me kind of look better than I am. And I really started studying it intensely um, in about 2013 when I returned to Microsoft. And so now I figured I knew enough about it to throw 30,000 words down on paper and, uh, and I teach a course on, on storytelling. Now that's a tough one, right? Yeah. If you're teaching a course on storytelling, you better tell some damn good stories. And so, um, um, I think I do. It's kind of interesting where stories and technology overlap because I mean, I'm, I'm a 
big story fan. I mean, I love, I, I learn more when I hear it in terms of a story uh, because it makes it real. You're basically taking information, knowledge, and, and relating it to something that we understand. Uh, I was listening to the TED Look Radio at you Hour. you teaching my book, man. <laughs> oh, you know, I haven't even read your book. I've just been an observant human. I mean, that's pretty awesome, I think. I was listening to a TED Radio Hour on uh, X, you know, where X came from, The Unknown, and Randall Monroe, who we've had on our show, was on there. He's saying he was teaching this um, weekend class at MIT in physics to uh, high school students. Yeah, it was a weekend. It's kind of a weekend thing, isn't it? Why not? Well, you know, you think about the kind of kids that would take a weekend physics class at MIT in high school, yeah. right? So he started with the regular, you know, you know, a f you have a five k weight, and you have a, a bin of water, and all this stuff, and potential energy, and they, you know, their eyes are glazing over. And then he says, "No, nah, man, you know, we're going to have to relate this." So then he poised a question. He said, "You know what? Screw all that. How much energy do you think it would take for Yoda to lift Luke Skywalker's X-wing fighter out of the swamp?" And then they were like, oh, my God, we're going to have to know the mass of the X-Wing fighter. And they're all looking up on Wikipedia, you know, trying to find the and – and it just energized them. And that's the difference between just presenting data or presenting examples and, and a story. Well, there's a lot of people who believe that, you know, we, we're actually evolved for, for story. And if mm -hmm. you start throwing data at us, we, we, don't, we don't get it. Uh, but, you know, if you think about it, before the written word and the stories and, 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 you know, sitting around a fire and, and, and passing along tradition and culture to the younger generation, yeah. that's, you know, it's kind of what we did. And, and, you know, we've evolved, our brains have evolved to, to hear that. And, you know, anybody who's ever been a kid or had a kid knows the, you know, tell me a story. Yeah. That's you know, what you hear right before you go to bed and, and, you know, you snuggle up and you tell stories. And it's interesting to see that, you know, my two kids, my, my daughter liked the same story over and over and over again, you know, hmm. go dog, go. She could, she, even before she could read, she could, she, she memorized the, the pages of like five books, right? The big green pocket book and, 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 and go dog, go. I remember were two of them. And, um, and then my son was just the opposite. My son wanted, wanted new sh every night. Right. So I would actually just make stories up laying in bed with him and, and, you know, and they were always about him, right. There's always this little boy named Shay and this cool thing would happen. And, um, right. and you know, it's, it's bonding, man. Parents who, who bond with, uh, through stories with their kids have, have, have a great relationship uh, uh, with them their whole life. So get good at this stuff, man. It is interesting personality wise for those who want, who love a retelling versus tell me something new. Yeah, it's probably, it's probably brain wiring. You know, I think mm. um, my daughter also has, you know, like OCD and stuff like that. So, so, you know, that, that whole repetitive thing, the whole ritual and tradition is really strong with her. And my son's just random, man. He's even to this day. <laughs> <laughs> so watch, watch the stories that your kids uh, love. It tells a lot about their personality when they, when they get, sure. get older. I remember telling my kids stories when, uh, when they were little and it, they always wanted to hear the same characters right. and the same sort of story, but just different details, you know? Tying those stories together over time. Yeah. yeah, because they're safe. Like, they they know what they're getting into. They know they're going to go on a ride. They know it's going to be funny. And, you know, there's there you go. So, I mean, that's why they liked it. I, I, they always uh, involved Paddington, which was their, you know, favorite teddy bear. Right. Mm. Lots of stories there. I read my, my daughters, who are in their 20s now, uh, still firmly remember every night reading the hobbit wow you know that that was the thing right it's important to them that yeah no dad read us the hobbit over months and then watership down was our other big one. you all ever read that to your kids it's I about read that. Mm -hmm. yeah classic well, yeah what a killer story man it's a great what story. a killer story and so that's you know one of the one of the points i make in my book is that the characters you know stories are the only thing that have characters and, you know, if you remember Watership Down and Bigwig and Hazel and, 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 um, you know, General Woundward, um, you know, the, the, those characters are really, are really uh, powerful. And, you know, they convey things in their own point of view that you can't get, you know, no, nothing besides story has, has characters. In right. It. And so, you know, if you're, you're telling a story that has powerful characters, 
those characters are kind of with you on stage while you're telling the the story. If you're just relaying facts, if you're just relaying data, dude, you're naked and alone up there, and and it's just not not very interesting. And and so um, you know, if you think of things like Game of Thrones, you know, most people when they start talking about something like that, they'll immediately start talking about uh, their favorite Arya Stark and, and Tyrion Lannister and the and the really powerful uh, uh, characters that, that that make up that that story. It's way beyond plot. It's way beyond theme. It's way beyond all of those other storytelling mechanisms. You have to have powerful characters. I drink and I know things. <laughs> I've got that <laughs> mug. <laughs> yeah, oh boy. How does story come into play in the technology world? In the training of uh, people to, to help them understand complex ideas? How, how do you use it? I, I don't think. I mean, yeah, you, 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 you can use it that way. I think there's a couple of, of, of ways. You know, to me, story is um, something that's helped my career. And so on a personal level, you know, we have to tell the story of ourselves here every quarter. We sit with our manager and we have this thing called a connect. Microsoft calls them now and, and you explain what you've done. And, you know, if, if you're boring during your connect, during your performance review, it, it's certainly not going to help you. Um, I always plan out a story to tell my, my manager. For, for every single one, I had a manager here that, that popped popcorn for some of my performance reviews. He's like, all right, this is going to be good. I'm going to hear a story. And, and so no, I think awesome. prom- promoting yourself. Yeah. That, that's a, uh, that's a badge of honor getting somebody to pop popcorn for your, right. but, um, uh, you know, the, you make yourself more interesting. You make your ideas more compelling. And it's not just in one on one situations. It's sitting around a conference room saying, all right, what fee arguing for your feature? Um, being able to make it more compelling and being able to talk about, hey, this is how a user, which would be a character in your story, uh, would use this. And this is how it would it would change their, their lives. And and so, you know, just presenting the UI and all that boring, boring shit won't, right. won't, won't cut it. So isn't the challenge to make stuff really um, relatable to what's happening now and the, the things that we're all experiencing now? I mean, you know, if you, you tell a story about knights in shining armor and all this stuff that, you know, uh, old old culture and things that we can't relate to, we can only relate to in our imagination. I mean, uh, how do you do that? How do you make the what you're talking about in the story relevant to today? Well, I mean, uh, so I, it's funny. I just had a conversation with uh, some of our search people over in, in Bing and you know, we're, it's all relevant stuff, right? How do we make sure fake news doesn't get promoted? How mm-hmm. do we make sure that, you know, um, you know, as you can't just buy your way to the top, there has to be some sort of, uh, cause that's what the Russians did, right? They just bought the ads. Mm-hmm. The ads didn't need sure. to be relevant. The ads didn't need to be important. The ads didn't even need to be true, right? Right. The money rules in the, in the search ecosystem. And, and so now the conversation within Bing is all about, you know, uh, these stories and, and what's happening in the real world. And how do we make sure that, that, you know, our search results uh, rise above that? And so the real world comes in all the time because as soon as you say, you know, Donald Trump, as soon as you say Hillary Clinton, the, the thing about those characters is, is there's so much context. That yeah. comes into the listener's head immediately. You say Donald Trump is like, ah, you know, right. All this stuff just kind of floods into their head. You don't even need to say it out loud as part of your story. Right. Um, just mentioning the people's names, mentioning fake news brings all that context with it. So it's a, it's a really um, powerful thing inside your listener's head. Yeah. And, and it, I guess as a storyteller, it's a mistake to resist those assumptions that when you say this, you you've got to work with the assumptions that they you know they already have. I mean, you've got to think it through. You know, the, uh, people who just you know spout facts and spout data. You you've got to think this through. You know, these you've got to convince people of a lot of things throughout your career. You got to convince mm-hmm. them that you know stuff, right? In job interviews, uh, you've got to you've got to convince them that your ideas are good. You've got to convince them that you understand this technology. You've got to convince them that you thought through uh, the the historical nuances, whatever it happens to be. And they're going to be a lot more receptive if you wrap all that in story than if you just throw facts at them. Sure. I, I got to wonder when you throw facts at people, if they aren't effectively just trying to assemble a story in their head anyway, you, you're just making mm-hmm. them do it. 
Uh, I, don't, I think they're too lazy to do that. I think they're, they're <laughs> they, don't, they they just tune you out, right? You, I mean, think about it. People are walking around with these magical little screens in their in their pocket. Um, that they can pull it out anytime they want. You know, I, I go to talks all the time, and everybody in the audience has got their phone under the desk. They look, they're staring at their laptop screen. They're 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 not paying attention. Uh, never assume that the audience is going to work in right. order to understand your idea. And if you're making the audience work to understand your idea, um, they're not going to bother. They got shit to think about. They've got their own problems. Mm-hmm. They got their own schedules. Mm-hmm. They've got their, their, their next meeting or their next piece of work that they're going to have to do. You have to work your way inside someone's thought processes and inside someone's uh, cranium. And, and you know, you're good at this when you give a talk and you see people, not using their devices and, and if they oh, are right. using their devices, they're probably tweeting about you or, or taking notes or, mm. or something like that. Um, get good, man. It's too, I mean, I can't <laughs> stand the boredom in corporate America. I can't stand going to meetings. And this isn't just Microsoft. This was Google. This was academia. This was all those companies you spouted off at the beginning. Boredom is everywhere. And yeah. When, You don't bore people. You stand out. This is low-hanging fruit. Why you wouldn't want to be a good storyteller, it boggles my mind. Because there are so few of us that we tend to rise to the top. Yeah. I mean, my title title is Distinguished Engineer. And I can tell you firsthand, Sacha, don't listen to this part, okay, Sacha? Just just (laughs) push. There's nothing nothing distinguished about my engineering. (laughs) <laughs> I seem better than I am because all the code I write, I put my hot tub on the Internet of Things. But but it's such a good story <laughs> that that people are like, oh, my God, James knows all this stuff about machine learning and, and AI because his hot tub is smart. And Hey, hey James, I don't mean to be boring, but we got to take a, a very short minute to uh, to hear this very important message from one of our sponsors. Hey, Rockheads, this is Carl. Have you tried JetBrains Rider? It's a new cross-platform .NET IDE that's light yet powerful and comes from the makers of ReSharper, IntelliJ, IDEA, and WebStorm. You can write .NET code on Windows, Mac, or Linux. Rider has you covered. Rider helps you develop ASP.NET, .NET Core, .NET Framework, Xamarin, and Unity applications. Most languages used in .NET development are supported. From C Sharp, VBNet, F Sharp, and XAML to ASP.NET Razor syntax, JavaScript, TypeScript, and all that other front end stuff. It comes with navigation, thousands of code inspections, refactorings, unit testing, debugging, rich coding assistance, and more advanced IDE features powered by proven technology from ReSharper and WebStorm. Download Rider now and take it for a 30 day trial at rider.com. Dot net dot com. That's R I D E R dot D O T N E T R O C K S dot com. And we're back. You're listening to Dot Net Rocks. I'm Carl Franklin. Richard Campbell's here. James Whitaker is here talking about stories. And you were just telling us about your hot tub. Yeah. I mean, so <laughs> the idea, <laughs> the idea here was to, you know, I wanted to do some ML and AI programming. I hadn't really done it since, uh, since, since my PhD dissertation. And, and so I thought, okay, you know, what do I do? And I could have pulled some boring, um, device out, you know, and put it on the internet of things and and had it learn some And I decided to do my hot tub knowing that this is going to be a great story, right? Whether, whether I'm successful or not, um, whether it's able to order its own chemicals and, and test its own water and, and, you know, know who's going in and out of it, whether I'm successful or not, I'm going to come up with a, with a, with a great story. And it is a good story. It's out there if you if you bing it. Did you did you hear that? I said bing. That's that's that I, yeah. I didn't say. Well, people were expecting Google. I said bing. So you didn't say bingle. You didn't say Google Bing. You said bing it. <laughs> bing gotcha. that. Shit. And and um, <laughs> you know it it makes for um, uh, and people learn right. They walk away from my course on machine learning after after here at my hot tub and going through the code and understanding a lot more than if I just, you know, page through the SDK or man files or something like that. Um, stories are really important. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's just a couple of different elements here. There is the story you're telling and then how you tell it. 
So obviously the, the story itself is going to be some important. If I break it down into three, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's what you say. And that's important, right? That's the first one, what you say. Because, you know, uh, let's eat grandma and yeah. let's eat grandma, right? <laughs> Are the same exact words. One little comma. <laughs> so it's, one so little what, comma. it's what you say, uh, uh, how you say it. And then if you're in how you say it is, you know, slowing your words down. Let's eat grandma. Um, <laughs> uh, slowing and, and speeding up your, your words and. And, and a lot of the, the, the words, you know, if, if you want to exhibit passion, you've got to sound passionate, right? And, mm-hmm. and if you want to seem conspiratorial, you lower your voice and exactly the way you would. And, and so it's what you Don't say, it's how you say. It. And then, and then the third part is what you do while you're saying it. You know, that's the choreography, the movement around, around the stage. If you're, if you're giving a talk. And by the way, give talks. I mean, if you're not going to conferences and, and being part, that's the best way to be part of your industry. It's the best way to develop a following. It's the best way to, to, to nurture your personal brand is to get out there and show people how good you are at it. So it's what you say. It's, it's how you say it and what you do while you're saying it. And, and when you're coming up with your story, you're thinking about all three of those elements each time. It's also really important to develop a spidey sense of when you're overdoing it, right? And people can sense that you're not confident or that you're, you're like, hey, I'm really excited. But I, if you guys don't like it, I'll be not so excited. You know what I mean? Well, you, you've got to really watch yourself and, and it's a painful thing to do to yeah. watch your recording of yourself giving a talk. Um, but you got, you got to realize what you're doing. Like, uh, <laughs> I saw this talk one time and, and this dude, this dude had his zipper down, man, the whole, oh. time, right. Right. And I'm just so embarrassed for the guy. And then I, I didn't even know I was doing it, but. For the next few talks I gave, I kept checking my zipper. It looked like I was fondling myself up there. And I didn't realize <laughs> until I watched the video and I'm like, oh, my God, James, what are you doing, dude? Yeah. And and so, um, you know, you kind of got to go back and watch them and be critical of, of yourself and and also be critical of others. You notice people saying, um, and, and, and being hyper alert to the mistakes other people are making will be kind of a reminder, hey, don't do that. Because we do tend to learn from other people. We tend to laugh like the people who in our lives, we tend to, um, um, you know, pause like the people in, in our lives. We learn from others. So right. be careful what you're absorbing from others. And, who is and it, sure. Laurie Anderson, that said language is a virus? It really is. It's in fact, because it's certain, infectious. Yes. It's infectious. It it it's like personality molding, and that's what you know creates culture. Like I've got Brazilian friends. I find Brazilians to be um, uh, a very contiguous and. You know, I love. find it really hard to believe that you've got a Brazilian friends. I mean, a <laughs> hundred, five hundred, maybe even a couple of thousand. But a Brazilian friends—that's kind of hard <laughs> to believe, man. Dude, we need to we need to work on your language a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe just maturity level. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, please don't. <laughs> I like myself just the way I am. We got it a half hour in without a fart joke. We're doing good. <laughs> I don't know any fart jokes. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a giant fart. Discuss. Uh, how much tailoring do you do for a given story or a given talk to a given audience? Hmm. That's a good question yeah. because uh, I know the answer to it. That's kind of like the question. That's what I, I look for in a question. <laughs> now, you know, some, sometimes you just, you've got to just plow through it and, and you don't have yep. time to research every audience, especially if you're given as many talks as, as I do. Um, so I just, you know, I give the same talk. And the thing about giving the same talk, regardless of the audience, is you get good at it. Uh, you get practiced at it. The, the transitions between slides, the transitions between points, the transitions between stories become really smooth. Uh, and so in general, I, I don't bother too much with the audience. But when there's some obvious um, constituencies, you know, I speak to all female audiences here at Microsoft on a regular right. basis. Right? The w- women of Windows, the, 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 the women of Azure, they have... Um, mailing lists and they get together and often so that one's going to be a little bit different um and 
you know, when I go to some of the Asian countries that are tend and tend to be more sensitive, uh, that's going to be a little different, especially if, you know, you're talking through interpreters. Yeah. Uh, sure. You know, you can't tell a joke through an interpreter. And so, nope. you know, those are those talks tend to be a little less um, fun and a little bit more factual. And and so, you, you know, you, you want to pay attention to your audience, but you don't you can't over rotate too much on on their differences or you're going to spend all your time constantly updating your talk. Make sure the talk is really good and it's really important to be authentic. It's one mm -hmm. reason I don't bother filtering my language. Um, swearing is part of who I am. Mm. And, you know, some of the cleanest mouth presenters I've seen in in my time and being in audiences, uh, they swear in real life like more than me. Um, right. And so, you know, to me, it's it's really more important to work on yourself. Be, be really authentic and let people uh, see the real you because they're going to relate to that, you know, warts That's and true. all. And so yeah. one of the advices I give is never tell, you know, never brag. No, don't tell brag stories, that, especially about your kids. No yeah. one wants to hear about your kid getting into Stanford, right? <laughs> off. Well, my kid didn't get into Stanford. <laughs> and, and so, you know, you, <laughs> you've alienated, you know, a whole bunch of your audience. And so understanding that your yeah. audience are people who, you know, I'd much rather talk about my child's eating disorder. Uh, than I would my my child's uh, prowess at, at at something. I'd rather talk because about my eating disorder. <laughs> <laughs> you win a lot more uh, emotional connection with your audience uh, when you when you present your real self, uh, warts and all. Yeah, that's absolutely. True. That the self uh, deprecation uh, is is a good thing to let people know that you're human and. This happened to me, and I, you know what? I'll just go ahead and tell a little story you must right be here. Really good at self-deprecation. I am so <laughs> good at it. I made a career out of it. So, <laughs> basically, what happened was I didn't realize that I wasn't getting voicemail on my new-ish phone, which is a Samsung Galaxy S8 Plus. Okay. And I, I got it a couple of months ago. I realized there was, I wasn't getting voicemail. And then I realized, well, there's no voicemail button. And I go to the phone and there's no indication that I have voicemails. There's no UI for voicemails on this phone. And so somebody said, I left you a message. I'm like, message, message, message. So I went into settings and I found in voicemail, there all there is is a number. And there's not even a contact associated with that number. There's just a number. So I go to the number and I call it and I've got 28 voicemails. So I, I call back some of these people and I apologize and say, you know, I'm really sorry, but I didn't even realize I had voicemail until an hour ago. And that's why I'm getting back. And the, most of these people said, you know, coming from someone like you, that makes me feel so much better about myself. <laughs> because if you get stumped by technology, then I feel a little bit better for not knowing how to, you know, send a send an email or, you know, join what a Facebook group. What is this group. voicemail thing of which you speak? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So I, ha I actually download an app I called Vision I get so annoyed voicemail. when people leave me voicemail, right? That's like the last thing I want. Text yeah, why not me, just send, send a fax? Me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Smoke signals. Hey, Richard. Yeah, buddy. Guess what time it is now? Uh, I must be that happy time again. Yeah, man. It's time to announce my new 12-step program for compulsive talkers. It's called On and On and On. <laughs> I know I've heard that somewhere before. I don't know. Apparently, it's not conducive to compulsive laughing, oh. which would be something <laughs> entirely different. I laugh See, at you all the time, the, man. The joke, the joke bombed, but the self uh, deprecation <laughs> work. I, this I, is I think, why I say I made a career out of it. James. You found your skill set, and and it, you know the fact that you've got so much to deprecate on. Is, Absolutely, is that's what you do. You tell a bad joke, and then you make fun of yourself, and it's just as fun, actually funnier than a funny joke. All right. Well, anyway, it's time to give away a D Experience subscription from Dev Express to one lucky member of our .NET Rocks fan club. Become a UI superhero with Dev Express UI controls and libraries and deliver elegant .NET solutions that address customer needs today. 
and leverage your existing knowledge to build next-generation touch-enabled solutions for tomorrow. Whether it's an office-inspired application or a data-centric analytics dashboard, DevExpress Universal ships with everything you'll need to build your best without limits or compromise. And check out their DevExtreme React grid, built from the ground up to fully support all the cool features that come with React, like the virtual DOM and state controllers like Redux. It supports master detail, sorting, grouping, paging, and editing. You can check it out and test it for free on GitHub. Learn more and download your free 30-day trial of DevExpress Universal at devexpress.com slash superhero. Well, all right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner is George Meng. Hey, we're actually George. Yeah. Golf clap for you, sir. Yes. Yes. And George just won the D Experience subscription, a big pile of awesome from our friends at DevExpress just by being a member of the .NET Rocks fan club. And if you don't know what that is, go to .NET Rocks.com, click on the big Get Free Stuff button, answer a few questions, and join the fan club. We have thousands of members all over the world. In every show, we like to give away stuff from our sponsors. And every December, we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree to one lucky member selected at random. But you got to sign up to win. And now it's your turn, James. If you had $5,000 right now to spend on technology, what would you buy? I'd buy everything Arduino makes. I love their processors. Hmm. And um, they're, they're, so, so they, what I love about their processors is that there's, there's, uh, their hardware, they don't put an operating system on, on their devices. They generate just enough operating system to run the code that you've written. And I just mm. think that's efficient and, and wonderful. And, um, that's what I would buy. Cool. IoT's the future and everyone needs to go. If they're going to spend their own imaginary $5,000, mm. it's going to be buying stuff that is the future and getting really good at it. And yeah. IoT, particularly devices that monitor the environment and, and learn in some way and try to do something for humans, you should get good at that because uh, otherwise your skills are going to atrophy. Totally agree. And there is a ton of Arduino, quote unquote, stuff. Like you can get there, as there gadgety is. as you want to get. Would go a long way, though. Um, they're Italian made, aren't they? I believe yeah. so. Yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. suits, cars, and coffee, and now Arduino. Yeah. What a <laughs> and great don't country. forget vino. Nah, I can forget oh. vino. I'm really? a beer guy. I'm a sorry. Nice falpolicella or an no, amarone. I can't do it. I can't do it. Mm. Sorry. Oh, I'm wow. so unsophisticated. I might buy Just a wine making kit. Give me a good, good hand pulled ale in the north of England. It's so cold and rainy and gross that the the room temperature beer tastes amazing. To go along with yeah, that yeah. wonderful northern England cuisine. Mm -mm -mm. Hey, mm -mm. I, I I like <laughs> me some English cuisine. Okay. Oh, roasted chicken. I went to the Fox and, and the Hound. I don't know which one they fed me. <laughs> 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 now, see, he's funny. You're self deprecating. You got your, you got your niches, man. Go with those niches. <laughs> oh man! All I know for sure is I don't want to go to the Elephant and Castle. <laughs> Don't well, it's not up. a good time to buy Arduino. I just went to Arduino.cc. They are sold out of everything. I think I know what people got for Christmas. Hmm. Yeah. They no are doubt. wiped out. They're good. They're good. Good stuff. Highly recommend them. Yeah, no kidding. Sign them on as a sponsor because they're getting some free uh, advertising here. Yeah. A fine idea. All right. We got to dive back into this because, I mean, there's a lot to know. Do you Do you have sort of a standard formula when you're constructing a story uh, sort of, you know, we ages ago in the early tech conference discussions, it was like, tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell them it, then tell them what you told them. Right. Yeah, that's a great way to make them feel stupid. <laughs> I told you, here's what I'm going to tell you. Now I'm going to tell it to you. It's only and necessary now, <laughs> if you're teaching boring stuff. Oh, my God. Just in case you're so dim you didn't get it the first time, I'm going to summarize what I told you. <laughs> so, no, that's bullshit. And, and most <laughs> templates are bullshit. You know, the whole scene, set the scene, make sure you have ascending action, and then there's a climax, and then, you know, these descending action, and then resolution. I call bullshit. Just the fact that, that you're trying to, to impose structure on me 
is going to make sure that my story is much less authentic and, and genuine. Yeah. So no, you don't do that. Um, but there, there are some kind of rules of thumb. I call them spells. So my book is called the, the, the storyteller's spell book. Uh, because I really do believe you're, you're like a spellcaster. You're trying to get inside somebody's head. Right. You're trying to make sure that you are the ones that are in control of their thoughts. You are the one as a storyteller that decides which neurons fire, which in, in their head, right. um, which emotions they, they evoke. Uh, it's very powerful. And I think the storyteller, the spellcaster metaphor is a, is a good one. But, uh, there, there are a couple of things that you just can't get wrong. Like the first 30 seconds has to be really, really good. And so get your character up a tree, take the best thing you got, right? The most important thing you got and say it first. I'm, what are you waiting for? You know, right. you built trying to build up suspense that you're not Steven Spielberg. Stop trying to do this. You're no. not making a movie. Stop being stupid and <laughs> get my attention in the first 30 seconds. And so mm-hmm. part of that is not introducing yourself. I never introduce myself. You know, introductions are really artificial because it's a brag fest. Oh, I've been 30 years in the industry and, and I've worked on all of these products. And, right. and I, if, if you have to do that, let somebody else do it. Um, don't do it yourself. Just let Carl do it. He'll do anything. Let Carl do it. Carl <laughs> did a good job. I think he yeah, represented. Yeah, yeah. Well, That's my job to not be funny and to introduce people. And, and so, um, uh, get right to the point. Um, make it, make it really, really, you know, pique their interest. Whoa, what's yeah. this, what's this person going to say? Who is this person? I love it on Twitter when I see, you know, you follow like the hashtag for the conference and my talk starts and the hashtags are like, who the hell is this guy? Um, man, this is what, <laughs> what the is. and, and, and then they find out at the end and now they have reason to, to be interested in me, right? No one's interested in my resume at the beginning. But if I make an impression, they're damn well going to be interested at the end. Um, and, and so so that first 30 seconds, I generally spend more time coming up with my opening line uh, than I do really the rest of the, the, the talk combined, because the rest of the talk's not important if you don't hook them uh, quickly. And, and so, mm-hmm. you know, to me, storytelling is a journey. Um, you are taking them from from a place of, you know, maybe ignorance or, or lack of information or or not knowing. And then you take them to a place where they have knowledge. They know stuff that they didn't know before. And, and on the way there, you know, you need to keep them engaged. And so you need to be really cognizant of what you have that's really interesting and what you have that's just kind of factual. Because sometimes you just got to throw the shit out there. Right. You, you can make I can make Azure look pretty cool. I can't make every feature of Azure, you know, be totally cool. So sometimes you got to throw stuff out there, but you got to realize people are going to lose intention. So I call this the journey spells in the book. And, you know, this this process of taking them from the beginning to the end um, does mm-hmm. have some recommendations. There are some spells you can cast, um, but no structure. Creativity wow. and structure are opposed. And if you want to be a creative speaker, you got to throw the structure away. It does make sense to sort of just give them a payoff right at, right at the beginning, you know, as a thank you for, for coming to see me. I'm going to give you a little, give you a little nugget to chew on. Yeah, they they've you know gone out of their way to be there, right? Um, make them ha- make them happy that they got there. Take them someplace valuable, right? Um, by the end of it, and you know if that alone is your structure, my goal is to teach them something they didn't know before. My goal is to put them in a place of value uh, at the end of this this talk. Just thinking through your story with that in mind is going to make sure that it's pretty pretty darn powerful because most speakers don't think what their audience really needs. They're speaking to their audience right. mm-hmm. and not for their audience. And, and you know, audience members um, uh, appreciate it. You know, go to a conference, sure. watch all the speakers and see who wants to take selfies and, and, and uh, with them, right? Selfies are the new, are the new uh, autograph. Um, and, and so see the speakers who have the people lined up. I want to take a selfie with you. Um, because you've gotten through to them. You have you right. have given them something of value and they want to take a, a picture of you away and, and remember it by its powerful man. Yeah, then that's an interesting metric. It's just that people want to be people feel like they're connected with you and, and this is a manifestation of that. 
Yeah, if you don't collect Twitter followers after you've given a conference presentation, stop giving conference presentations. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess that's fair. Maybe somewhere on that slide, you're going to have to put your Twitter address, I guess. <laughs> uh, put it on every one. You know, that's part of branding. Um, you, you don't don't announce it. Don't be prominent about it. I put it at the at the bottom right corner of every one of my slides and, and it's there for people. And I, I collect Twitter followers by the hundreds every time I right. get a talk. So that's good. That's a good thought. Uh, you know, it's funny because you talk about no structure and so forth, but you you are a planner. You do plan through your presentation. You, you've got your story worked out. I do. And I tell my story over and over. Right? I've got two of my stories I teach in my uh, – they're both in the book and they're both in my um, – in the videos that are online. Um, the, one is about meeting Bill Gates uh, and one is about having a restroom conversation with Larry Page. <laughs> and, you know, the the first few times I told it, they're, they're both true, completely true, um, but they're made more interesting by, you know, storytelling constructs um, uh, as I as I tell them. And, you know, there's ways of increasing your drama by what you say, how you say it and what you do while you're saying it. But those are those are two of my um, uh, anchor stories. And the reason I tell them is one, because I've turned them into really good, funny stories. Yeah. And the other is because there's a lesson in there, right? You are going to, at some point, meet someone important. You are going to meet somebody who can positively affect your career. And when they ask you, what do you do? What are you going to say? Most people yeah. that moment up, right? They walk down the hall. The, here comes the CVP. And the CVP is like, oh, hey, hi, how are you? Uh, what do you do here? And they say something stupid, like, oh, I'm a program manager. We have <laughs> 10,000 program managers, right? They, you're, right? You're not helping yourself by boring people who ask you what you do. I make awesome people be awesome together. <laughs> that, sucks. What we I need to, that sucks. We need to work on Oh, hey, you know, it's good for me, though. <laughs> I mean, my bar is pretty low. And, and so, um, uh, you know, that, that's everybody needs to have that story just kind of uh, uh, in the bag ready to pull out at a cocktail party, ready to pull out at a bar, ready to pull out at a conference, ready to pull out. This is what I do. This is, this is what, what, what makes me yeah. up. Uh, it makes me get up in the morning. James, do you have a quick story you can tell us? What kind of story do you want? Uh, something entertaining and awesome. <laughs> so the reason, the way I became a software tester, this is another story you need to have. Like, why did you get into storytelling? Why did you get into testing? Why did so testing, security, and storytelling have been my three um, uh, specialties over the years? Mm -hmm. So, how did you get into testing? How did you get into security? How did you get into storytelling? I'm going to get asked those questions. So, um, I got into software testing uh, because of a girl. Uh. I was a software developer working with my professor and a bunch of other graduate students writing code day in and day out. I thought I was such a bad, right? Twirling bits around, bending computers to my will. I was such a bad. And then I met a girl and this particular girl worked nine to five, right? I'd never had a nine to five job in my life. And so to her, Saturdays were kind of sacred. Unfortunately to me, Saturdays were the day, one day where all of us didn't have class where we could all code together. Right. So this girl moved in with me. We're sleeping together, right? Saturday morning comes along and I start sneaking out of bed because I got to go to the lab and code with a bunch of nerds. <laughs> and she stops me, right? And she pulls me back into bed. Where are you going? No, no, no. Everything's good, right? So waited. She started, you know, snoring again, the drools accumulating on the pillow. <laughs> She's sound asleep. I begin to sneak out again and she grabs me and, and pulls me back in. And she said, really? What, what are you doing? I said, ah, oh, baby, I got to go to work. And she's like, Jimmy, <laughs> you've got a naked girl in your bed. 
<laughs> Guess which one I chose. <laughs> <laughs> and so I got fired, right, for choosing the girl and became – was assigned to be a software tester because clearly I couldn't be trusted to show up on a Saturday. <laughs> and they demoted me. They cut my salary. Here I am now testing – Instead of creating, I'm testing the shit that someone else did. And and not Ugh. only did I get the girl, but being a software tester was an amazing uh, a career turn for me. So, um, yeah. I got the girl, I got the career, and I got a good story, man. What could be better than that? That's a great story. Awesome. Well, I'm well told, sir. Yes, well told. Ah, well told. thanks, man. It was the nudity that did it. See? You yeah, know I'd that say, NC-17 sell, it sells it every time. rating? Yeah, and, and it's low hanging fruit. Everything's fine till there's a naked girl in your bed. <laughs> I can't wait to see what your sensors do with this. Oh yeah, oh, oh that's gold, be, it, man. That's yeah. gold. Uh, for the non-professional speaker who's listening, because we've all spent our time on stage, I think we're all pretty comfortable with this. Uh, what do you say to folks who battle stage fright? Well, there's a chapter in the book on stage fright, so I have a lot to say on, on stage fright. Stage fright is a condition of the subconscious. Um, back a long time ago, um, our subconscious was, was, was developing that, you know, that flight and, and fright response. It's, that's mostly what it's capable of. You know, there's a lion in the bush. Your subconscious is like, hey, you're going to get eaten. And, and it generates a flight, fight or a flight response, right? So if your subconscious is like, oh, dude, this guy can't fight a lion, get the hell out of here and you run. Um, and, and that's the response that our subconscious is creating when we see the stage. Oh my God, I'm going to mess this up because there's an it's angry mob basic. in front of me. <laughs> right. And, and it's the same thing as the, the lion in the bush. You think, oh, I'm going to, this is going to be a bad thing for me. I'm going to freeze up. Uh, I'm going to embarrass myself. My career is going to be hurt. Yeah. Uh, people are going to laugh at me and, and, and you run. And so really what you need to do is you need to co convert that flight response to a fight response because, you know, you, our ancestors with, if I'm a bad, I'm training all the time and there's a lion in the bush, you know, my subconscious might be saying, you know what? He, he's got this. And so yeah. it's a, it's a, but it's a process of retraining your subconscious, um, uh, to to generate that fight response uh, because it's good you know I get I still get stage fright um, and I get up on stage and and I've trained myself to turn all that adrenaline and and all of that fear into energy to power me through my talk so mm. uh, anyhow it's it's an appendix in the in the book and it's also if you don't want to buy the book uh, if you go to medium.com slash at doc james w uh, I've got a, a blog post on conquering stage fright there too. So that's the, the free version of it. By the way, all my books, I don't, I don't like to advertise my sh but, uh, I donate it all to, to, to charity. So, um, uh, great. please buy. There's a great suggestion many years ago on .NET rocks by Don Kiley. You remember Don from Alaska? Oh, yeah. And he said he got over his stage fright by joining his local Toastmasters club. Yeah, you know, which is essentially an organization that encourages you to, you know, uh, a public speaking and gives you opportunities to do it in a safe environment. I don't, I don't know if that will help you get over it. I think there's more stuff you have to do, but Toastmasters is a really supportive environment, and so yeah. it's a good place to start the skills that I, I teach you how to basically retrain your subconscious. Mm. Uh, it's a good place to start because it's a friendly audience. Nobody's gonna. Nobody's going to laugh at you. They will right. videotape you and, and rip you apart. <laughs> uh, but, you know, no one's going to, there's no long-term judgment there. Yeah. But I mean, whether it's Toastmasters or whether it's, you know, just, you know, volunteering to give more talks for your, your team, uh, going to conferences and starting off with smaller track talks at, at first. I mean, the bad part about Toastmasters is that there is no pressure. And so it's not a real um, good a simulation of the real world where there is pressure. So, so sign up, volunteer to give talks, give as many talks as you can and, and practice, but don't forget to have something to say, right. right? If you're not good at anything, don't get up on stage. You got no story. Right. If, right. if, if you haven't developed skills that other people covet, or you haven't developed insights that other people need, stay off the stage. We have enough people up there boring this shit 
out of us. I don't want to encourage <laughs> more people to tell stories. I want to encourage the people who have stories to tell them better. Mm. Well said. James, wow, what a great show. And uh, bleeps aside, I think everybody's going to really get a lot out of this. And thanks for writing this book and sharing it with us. Hey, it was fun. Peace, my brothers. Absolutely. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Pwop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got transmit a band by the FCC. Yes, I'm a, a time boy. Life is hard. Pay my taxes.